Hello everybody, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage. You may have noticed that I have put up a video lately on the topic of sewing machine cabinets. Some of you may simply call them sewing machine tables and that's okay. I use the two terms interchangeably. And now I wanted to talk to you about price. Uh, you've heard me go on and on about how expensive these uh, sewing tables were. And uh, I've talked to you about the different options that you could get, you know, the different uh, styles, the different sizes of tables, and of course, then you would have lots of things to choose with upgrades. Uh, remember that, uh, as I mentioned before, you only got a carrying case when you bought a sewing machine. You didn't get a table. And this is because uh, the footprint, if you will, or the dimensions of the base of a sewing machine had stayed the same for many years because many people had sewing tables. And the, the selling model was at all the dealers, and this includes Singer, and you see a Singer 201 and a, a Singer table in front of you, is <clears throat> the selling model or the, the standard was you've got a machine, you've got a carrying case, uh, such as the wooden cases uh, back in the day, and they would eventually change those. But you had, of course, you, the option to upgrade to a table, and they had little tables. They had larger tables, such as the one you see here. So uh, you might have been offered uh, the chance to upgrade. Would you like a table? Yes, and they would show them to you. <clears throat> and then they would show you the different table models, and there was one even bigger than this table, at least in terms of its storage. But whoever purchased this table uh, actually bought one of the most expensive sewing cabinet, sewing tables um, in, the, in the dealership that could be had in approximately 1950. Now, this is a Singer 201. This machine is original to the table. And I believe I know about how much this uh, original customer paid for this. Now, you might think, well, how do you know? Do you have a receipt? I don't, but I'm going to show you at the end. We're going to go through... Uh, I'm going to tell you why I believe I know what it cost in 1950 and then what it would cost today, and it might astound you. Uh, but anyway, you are looking at cabinet model number 43. Uh, this, of course, is the Singer, uh, one of the Singer cabinet designs. Many of the companies had similar designs. Uh, none of them really strayed. A few of them had some innovative uh, styles to their cabinets, but... Overall, uh, sewing machine cabinets, as I've laid out, are built really tough, and so is this one. This customer opted to choose many upgrades. First, they chose a 201. They could have chosen a less expensive uh, Singer sewing machine, but they went with one of the most expensive models in 1950. In fact, it may have been the most expensive. <clears throat> and then they chose not only to upgrade to a table, but a larger table than one of those little smaller uh, um, side table, I don't know, lamp table looking uh, pieces, if you will. I'll have to get the exact cabinet number for them, but you've seen them in my other videos. Uh, but think about it. This customer said, no, I'd like a larger table, please. And I'm going to have the storage cat, uh, uh, cubbies or drawers on the right. And then they had to choose wood. It would have come in oak, maple. I, oak was probably standard. And then they could choose maple. They could choose cherry. They could choose walnut. But this customer chose mahogany. It would have been one of the more expensive of the um, wood choices. Now, I'm going to show you. We're going to zoom in just a little bit here. And I'm going to show you another upgrade that the customer chose. If you guys look straight down here, uh, look to the right on the inside of the cabinet, and you'll see a uh, little uh, pedal, if you will, and it is coming out from the right, just underneath the cabinetry there. That is the lever for speed control. It was built into the cabinet. Now, you could have gotten this fancy cabinet without that. It would have been slightly less. Um, this cabinet would have sold uh, with the option for a foot pedal for the sewing machine, which is what the 201 and all the others would have come standard with. Yes, you would have gotten a, a controller. You didn't have to pay extra for that. And <clears throat> when, when you had a cabinet, particularly with the Singers, 
you would have had choices. Now this is a button style Singer foot pedal. This is not, this did not come with this machine because this customer opted for the built-in uh, speed control. But normally you would have gotten a button style controller. And just as you might see on the inside of a Singer 301 grass cloth case, you would often see a little bracket that was screwed into the sewing table. And that bracket would often sit uh, somewhere inside, either on the side of the cabinet and sometimes just inside the fascia here. And the person would take the button style foot pedal and it would slide or slot down into this little bracket and it would stop. And then there was a, <clears throat> uh, a metal lever that dropped down, looks a little bit like a shoehorn, <clears throat> and that lever would be used for knee control. And so Singer would settle a lot of arguments in the home because you had multiple people often who would be using a sewing machine in the same house. And some people preferred foot control, some people preferred knee control. And it was a very clever selling tactic, but no, not this customer. This customer paid um, a lot of money for what you see here. And if they had already gotten a machine and just needed a cabinet, we're going to price out the cabinet today. And I'm going to show you just how incredibly expensive they were. Uh, and, I'm, and I believe that they were worth it when you consider how they were built. So you are looking at cabinet, Singer cabinet number 43. And it uh, is one of the few, I've seen many cabinets like this, but only every so often do I see cabinets with that built-in feature of speed control built into the cabinet and it has a little box underneath which actually has the same similar hardware that a foot pedal would but this was yet another way that the customer could could camouflage and hide away what was considered you know a mechanical device which of course it is and they were able to uh, put this in their home and as I've mentioned before, remember the average house in North America in 1950 was between eight and 900 square feet. And so, you know, that's about half of what they are today on average. And so when people made purchases, they had to be careful. You know, they had big families and space was at a premium. And so, of course, the machine uh, in this table, as for many tables made in the 20th century, it pivots down and the lid closes and the homeowner could have easily, um, you know, <clears throat> used this table for writing letters and taking care of the household budget, etc. But what I do want to talk about, of course, is price. And I'll explain to you why I believe I know how much this table, just the table alone, cost this customer in 1950. Okay, guys, this is the information that I came across once in one of the tables I purchased. It's been a while now. I had purchased a Necky in a Necky sewing table and it had come from the original owner. And it had lots of, um, lots of things that I've mentioned to all of you you should always ask for. And look in the drawers of a sewing table. Uh, you will find things that belong with the machine. Uh, and I've talked in other videos about when it's not in the table, how to ask for that. But today I wanted to show this particular brochure. This is a piece of a brochure that was in uh, uh, a table. Now this particular one was a Necky, but that's okay because I I'm showing you and talking to you about the price of a Singer table. But keep in mind that all the manufacturers had access to very high quality cabinetry and they were all in competition with each other. So it's safe to assume that, for example, the Necky um, it was a smaller company, but they had sewing machines in the same price points that Singer did. Not as many models, but they, they, they were basically trying to compete. And of course, they upsold customers with things like cabinets and accessories. And none of those things should have been dramatically different in price. Okay, that, that would have not worked uh, as a business model. They would have had to have been pretty competitive depending on the town and the location. So I'm showing you this side this, of course, talks, this is, like I say, this is sort of one half of a brochure. And on one section, it's got, talks about the magic and the automation of the Necky. And many of you have seen brochures like this, or you may have some. 
And there's a section here that talks about embroidery. Look at all the wonderful things you can do. Most of these customers didn't, but they had the tools to do so if they wanted to learn. But this is part of the brochure that when I saw it, if initially I just thought, okay, I have another brochure. That's nice. I can see the tables. But look very closely at this because what I learned is that I, I, I was reading the brochure one day and I noticed that written in pencil were prices. And it's my uh, theory that someone went into a Necky dealer uh, in 1950, because that's uh, the approximate year when the machine um, that this brochure went with originally uh, was made. So in 1950, you can imagine someone going into a dealership and asking the, uh, the retailer, hey, can you tell me what the prices of these are? I'm gonna have to, to either think about this or I'm gonna have to discuss it with my spouse. You know, we're gonna have to talk about this. And, and all of us here in this video, hopefully are gonna discuss why they had to and why it was so expensive. So I'm gonna zoom in here. Okay, everyone, I'm hoping this will pick up on the camera. But I'm going to go over with you the prices of these tables. It was written in pencil. And again, I suspect by the salesperson for the potential customer. This was not a flippant, impulsive decision. Buying any sewing machine or replacing one was a pretty big deal in 1950 for the average uh, consumer. And if you were going to buy a table, you really wanted to think about it. So let's look at, and, and all of these models, if you look at them, many of you who have old sewing machines, you may have a table that is styled somewhat like these. These are all, uh, this is a Necky brochure and Necky tables, but you could have gone into a Singer dealer or uh, a white sewing dealer or Sears Kenmore, and you would have seen a similar options because they were all trying to meet certain, you know, different styles. Uh, this one, for example, um, it has a price of, it is written in pencil, $306. This model, $289. Now remember, these are beginning prices. This would be for, you know, the lowest price wood. They're all great quality, but people paid extra for certain veneers. This model was $299. Uh, this was the Mega Ultra table, this one here. I've seen very few of these tables ever in the nine years I've been doing this. Very few people were willing to pay. This one was 379 and it's basically, it's going to be very similar dimensions to this model, which is more common. Many of you who have larger sewing tables, you have a table that's laid out something like this. Now the, the drawer styles and pulls may be different but it will typically have a series of drawers on the right, a support panel on the left. I suspect they were offered with the reverse, but because most of the customers were right-handed, this is why the cabinets were put here. But the main reason I wanted you guys to see this was for the pricing. So this model and this model are very similar, but they have different styling, but they're priced the same, $335 and again, $379 if you were just going to just, you know, shoot to the moon and, and, and spare no expense. Very few people did this. But when you see how much these tables cost in today's dollars, you're going to understand why. So how do I know? Uh, this is how I believe I know what the person paid in 1950. But then the real question that might be relevant for us is, if you were going to buy a table like this. Let's pick this one. It's, it's very similar to the, to the mahogany model I just showed you, the Singer number 43. So let's do a little um, investigating online. We can go and find a calculator that's going to tell us exactly what this would cost us today. Okay, everyone. There are a lot of places you can go online to look for this kind of information. I chose not to go to one. A lot of the banks have these and I'm sure they work fine, but I wanted something, I wanted to go to a site that wasn't specifically trying to sell me a product. And this is, this one happens to be the United States Department of Labor, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they have something called a CPI inflation calculator. That's, that CPI just means consumer price index. <clears throat> now this calculator was designed to calculate rates of inflation 
Well, actually, there are a lot of functions that it has, but that's what we're going to use it for today. Now, this is based on the United States inflation in the American economy, and this would have been over, um, uh, I think they've been going back more than 100 years, and it goes, its most current calculation goes up through April, which is just last month, and when, when May is over, they'll update it with May's. But for our purposes, this is going to work great. So you can look here. Um, I'll try to remember on my video to post the actual link uh, to where I found this one, but you can find others to use. Um, but anyway, I, let's go in here and we're going to take a price of the Necky version of the Singer table I just showed you. They would have been very similar in price. Okay, so you guys will remember uh, it is it was $335. So what you do is, with the calculator, I'm going to put in the amount of money, and it's going to ask me what you know what year, in month and year. So I don't know the month, so let's just pick the middle of 1950, June, for lack of a better... We don't really have to know the exact month for our purposes. So we're going to go all the way back to... 1950, right around the time this particular machine was made, and of course it was in the system for distribution. So we got June 1950. Now, if you look here, there's a place where it says calculator, and we're going to calculate. Let me zoom in, and I want you all to be able to see the figure when it comes up. So I've got my numbers in here. I've got Again, I have the, the, the you know, approximate month and then the year of when this money would have been spent. And then here's how much it would cost today. I'm going to hit Calculate. Take a really good look, guys. That's $3,597. And that does not include the machine. That is for just the table. And so... You know, again, it just, I, I put this in there and I thought, wow, no wonder they had to talk about this. This was a very expensive purchase. So you can just imagine this person going in, seeing the latest, the latest, uh, you know, cabinets and machines available for sale. And they really are, are, I mean, it's, you know, it's very tempting. And they chose to go for it. They chose to take almost every option except for the only other cabinet. The only other thing they could have bought was the $379 cabinet. They were already splurging tremendously on this purchase. And so, you know, it's not difficult to imagine how the original owner of this machine, um, this was a one owner, this particular machine and table you see in front of you, look at the condition of it. I know it was kept indoors all its life, and it's just remarkable. I mean, it's still, the, the lacquer on the cabinet still shines. It has a few nicks and bumps here and there, like any piece of furniture. But this piece of furniture is almost 70 years old, as is the machine. Now, the next thing I'd like to do, and all of you can help me, if any of you have receipts on what the original pricing was for the machine, it would be great for us to, to, uh, to do this because <clears throat> I want to do I want to run the same calculation on the price of a Singer 201 in 1950 and we need to do that because remember they would have bought both and the machine alone was so expensive back in the day uh, this was the most expensive Singer you could buy circa 1950 so anyway guys stay tuned 36 what did I say 3597 almost 3600 dollars that's a whole lot of money for a little table but it is beautiful and it is built like a tank but now you can see um, one of the reasons our ancestors took such incredible care of their possessions was because they paid dearly for them and they were well made they felt good about making that purchase because uh, obviously they chose well because with, you know, with care and maintenance, um, you know, there it is. It's still ready to go all these years later. So maybe that big price was worth it after all. Um, but anyway, thank you all for joining me and watching my, my series of videos on sewing machine cabinets or tables, if you will. And let me know what you think. Uh, many of you may have these. And uh, I think uh, whether you have 
uh, it doesn't matter which wood type you have, what veneer, what size table, I, whatever it is, wh whether it was a basic table or one of the more fancy ones like this, they are all incredible pieces of furniture. And when they are maintained, they, they are, they're amazing. You know, I would be proud to have this in my home. It's going to be, um, someone's coming to look at it today and it may be purchased. And just so you know, so you don't feel too badly, if you have a table that did not get as much love over its lifetime, take this one for instance. This is uh, one of the smaller uh, Singer. This is also a Singer sewing table. Many of you have tables that look somewhat like this. And um, you can see the top of this one. It's dirty, it's scratched. A lot of, a lot of its uh, lacquer has been uh, rubbed off. Even a piece of the um, veneer, as you can see, is gone and some of the veneer is lifting. But take heart because underneath all that dust is in a gorgeous table. In fact, the one that you're looking at, this little old one I'm showing you now, it is also mahogany. And it too can be, can be, uh, can be brought back to look like this gorgeous mint uh, cabinet 43 that I've just shown you. And you know, you can see the difference in how a, a table is treated over its lifetime. You know, <laughs> it's just, it's remarkable. But as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to be doing uh, videos on how to recondition or restore, if you will, uh, vintage sewing tables. And I have some techniques I'm going to be sharing with you all. And I promise they are actually not going to be that rigorous or time consuming. We are not going to be stripping or refinishing these cabinets. Oh, no, no. Um, <laughs> with all due respect to those of you who can do that, uh, it's not necessary. Uh, I've got some uh, things I use to, to bring these tables back and I'll be doing a series of videos over the summer on that for you. So stay tuned. Uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel, whether you care about vintage sewing machine cabinets or not, um, and whether you care to own one or not, uh, I have to tell you that if you ever see one, remember they were premium price products and they were incredibly well made. Uh, and they've, many of them have survived in spite of the rough lives they've had. This one, this one had a pretty cushy life and uh, it's going to be ready for its new owner, uh, hopefully today. But, uh, but I wanted to get this video in and talk about it because it'll be gone and I, I only come across uh, models with that built-in feature that I was showing you all, that built-in controller. I only see them so often. So anyway, feel, feel free to subscribe to my channel and uh, thank you again for watching. Again, I wanted to share this with you because uh, again, I've, many of you have seen literature from vintage sewing machines, sales brochures, but I seldom see a brochure on the cabinetry. Not everyone kept stuff like this, but when I saw the prices, and I saw they had been written in pencil by someone long ago. I thought, oh wow, this is a nice little window. Some of you may have other ways of finding out uh, uh, maybe old print ads or something. You know, sewing machines didn't really have a lot of prices in their advertising because they wanted the dealers to have room to be able to maneuver with that. But if any of you know, maybe you have receipts from an old machine that you have, that uh, shows things like pricing. Let me know. Maybe you have a cabinet price somewhere or you know how much that Singer 201 cost in 1950. But anyway, guys, stay tuned. I'm going to be looking for that information and more. But uh, like I said, it may, not, it may not always be apparent to you when you are looking at a sewing machine cabinet. But $3,597 today without a sewing machine without a sewing machine, guys. Just imagine what, <laughs> what that would be like and why not everyone went in and just you know plopped down. People were not using a lot of credit cards in 1950, if any. They were simply writing checks, right? People were uh, not really, oh, or you had to borrow it. You could finance it often through a singer dealer, and I'm sure that that was a source of revenue for them as well. But there you go, guys. Uh, remember to show your sewing tables respect their original owners did, and now you know why. Take care, and we'll talk soon about how to get your sewing table looking a lot better than it does now if it didn't lead the cushy, relaxed life that this beautiful mahogany version did um, under its original owner. Take care.